Okay, good evening, Facebook world. Welcome to another episode of Track Live. I am very honored to be joined today by Professor Lauren Wise at the Boston University School of Public Health. Dr. Wise, thank you for so much for joining us and welcome to Track Live. My pleasure to be here. Thank you so for inviting me. Yeah, we're coming live through Facebook. This is your chance uh, as the audience to write in questions, anything you wanna know about men's reproductive health, sperm quality, fertility. We're really honored to be joined by one of the top researchers in this area today, Dr. Wise, that we'll get into. I'm Greg Summer. I am the co-founder and also the chief scientific officer at TRAC Fertility. Just a quick plug for what we're doing. TRAC is now available. This is a system that allows you to measure, track, and improve your sperm count at home. Really intended for uh, people trying to get pregnant, learn more about their reproductive health, a way to to get tested and, and track and learn more about your reproductive health at home. Dr. Wise, you are the first epidemiologist that we have had uh, on Track Live. And I'm guessing a lot of people are like me and maybe don't really know what epidemiology is. Could you maybe start by explaining your field a little bit and, and tell us what you do? Sure. Well, the standard definition for epidemiology is the study of patterns, causes, and effects of health outcomes in human populations. And epidemiology is really the cornerstone of public health, and it really is used a lot to shape policy. Um, and so we like to think that the research that we generate from our studies can be used to improve the public's health. Um, so basically what I do is I design research studies um, and I enroll participants, I follow them over time, and I study how selected exposures influence um, health outcomes in my population. And my colleagues and I are particularly interested in studying predictors of infertility because it occurs in 10 to 15 percent of the U.S. population, um, and it's a significant public health problem. And um, it's also associated with um, adverse um, psychological and financial effects. Um, infertility treatment is very expensive and many couples don't even have access to infertility treatments in the US. Um, and it's also um, rel relatively unsuccessful. So not all couples actually have success with these treatments. Um, and there have been some studies showing that infertility treatment can cause um, adverse pregnancy outcomes. So insofar, you know, in as much as possible, we'd like to um, optimize fertility, natural fertility in the couples that we study and the couples all throughout the US. Um, so we're very interested in studying um, lifestyle, behavioral and medical history, uh, risk factors for infertility so that we can inform couples how they might um, improve their chances of successful pregnancy. Right, and I think that's what we really want to talk about today is these health and lifestyle risk factors. I think some people are surprised that, you know, fertility is even on the public health radar. Um, and that's really changed maybe even recently. And, and big thanks to researchers like you who are actually putting a lot of data and understanding to what's a pretty important issue and in, in, in growing in necessity. Um, I would ask the audience to feel free to write in your questions, anything that you want to know, something's on your mind, write it in. We'll also be recording this feed, have it on our Facebook feed, and Dr. Wise and myself, happy to take your questions uh, after you see it as, as well. But let's talk about Presto. So, Dr. Wise, you've gotten a lot of press and exposure around the study that you've been overseeing for some time. It's called the Pregnancy Study Online, or Presto. Why don't you tell us about Presto, what it is, why you started it, and um, where you're at? So we launched the study um, a little bit over four years ago, um, and it's funded by the National Institutes of Health. And it's a 12-month-long study that examines the influence of lifestyle and other factors on fertility. And eligible female participants reside in the US or Canada. Um, they're age 21 to 45 years, um, and they're actively trying to get pregnant now or within the next six months. Um, it's important that they not be using fertility treatments. We're really trying to study um, predictors of natural fertility and that they be in a stable relationship with their male partner. Female participants are asked to complete a very lengthy baseline questionnaire online. 
And then every two months thereafter, they complete a shorter questionnaire just to update their pregnancy status and any other um, variables that might change over time. So they do this. So you're specifically, you're specifically uh, reaching out to, to women who are either trying to conceive or, or thinking about trying to start a student. How do you, how do you reach them, I guess, first of all? What's the first step in this process? Well, we've been very um, lucky to use Facebook as our primary method for recruitment, which is quite ironic because this is a Facebook Live um, uh, news event um, or event. And so we've tried many different methods. We actually published a methods paper where we compared many different methods, um, primarily social media, um, health-related websites, even more traditional methods like putting a flyer up in a doctor's office or putting a flyer, a flyer up in a coffee shop. And we found that Facebook was um, most um, reliable in getting high numbers of participants at a low cost. Mm -hmm. um, and we are able to target participants um, uh, by gender, by age, and by marital status. So we can actually target participants who um, note that they were recently married. So we've had really good success targeting newlyweds. And we are also able to um, identify parents of young children. So those are the two um, demographic groups. That we you go on Facebook and you do targeted ads to, to young couples, newlyweds, and you say, hey, we've got this pregnancy study going on. And then, and then you send them a link to this, this questionnaire. Is, is that kind of the process? We, we show um, attractive images of happy couples who might be wanting to conceive. So that's one of the um, things that I think catches people's eyes. Um, and they're, they may be seeing this in their news feed or on the right column ad when they're least expecting it in a, in a very private setting. Um, and so they see this ad there. They, if they click on the ad, they are taken straight to our website. And that's where they can read about the study and if they're interested in the study and they think that they are eligible for the study, they can fill out an eligibility screener questionnaire. And if they are determined to be eligible, what we'll do is we will send them uh, an email to verify their email address. And that email will have the link to the baseline questionnaire. Oh, you broke up a little bit there, but uh, let me... Um... Let me show the website here since we're we're talking to people through Facebook. Uh, there's the website. So all of you young couples that might be watching this interested in, in taking part in a, a very cool science project and study on fertility, go to presto.bu.edu and and sign up. Um, uh, Dr. Wise, can you hear me? I know we're having maybe some connectivity issues. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Great. I can hear you. Yeah. So let's, let's keep going. So you've been doing this for four years. How many couples uh, have you been tracking through the magic of Facebook and the internet in, the, in those four years? So we've enrolled over 5,600 female participants and 1,400 of their male partners. So wow. this makes Presto one of the largest studies uh, certainly web-based studies of male participants worldwide. Wow, congratulations. How many, um, so 5,600 women, how many Presto babies so far? If, maybe that's not the right word, but how many pregnancies have you have you seen? We, we have uh, women complete a, a late pregnancy questionnaire, um, and we also find out about their births through the birth registry. So we have over 2,000 Presto babies that we've identified in, in the study. So that's very exciting to us. Congratulations, that is really exciting. Um, and I should mention, you know, at, at TRAC, we've been really pleased to, to partner with you on this study and we're, we've been doing some kind of sub-studies or smaller studies within Presto to, to have couples and men particularly in this um, study get a little bit more engaged and they can use TRAC to to report some sperm parameters at home. And that data we have found to be incredibly interesting. But from your perspective, I guess an epidemiologist perspective, why is the ability to gather this sperm data um, at home exciting or interesting to you? 
Well, this is, um, you know, collaborating with you has certainly been one of the highlights of my career, Dr. Summer. So thank you so much for reaching out to us. I'm very thrilled about our collaboration. Oh, um, this is well, really, <laughs> this is really groundbreaking, this work that we're doing, because um, if you think about it, most of the studies that have been conducted on semen quality have been done in men from fertility clinic populations. So being able to um, send a male participant from a general population study like Presto, um, send them a kit that they can use to analyze their own semen samples in the privacy of their own home is pretty groundbreaking. And it allows us to reach a broader group of men and to study um, a range of different risk factors for infertility in a broader group of men from different geographic regions, um, urban, rural areas, you name it. So, so I think that's one of the major strengths of our collaboration. Also having to measure semen quality um, in, in a lab is much more expensive. So as a researcher, we're very um, happy about being able to do it in a more cost-effective manner, in a more feasible manner. Well, thanks. We're we're equally excited, and it's it's um, <clears throat> so rewarding to see the the data that your team is able to put together. Can you maybe talk about some of the interesting findings that you've seen? You know, maybe partly from what we're doing with with track on a smaller level, but also just with the fourteen hundred male participants that are in this study. What are some of the more interesting tidbits that you can get a, give us about some of these health and lifestyle factors and how they can impact a couple's fertility outcomes? So just to um, mention that um, our, our research on men is very much in the preliminary stage. We have uh, three different analyses that we've presented in abstract form, but they haven't been published yet in journals, but I'm still able to speak about these three analyses. Um, perhaps right. one of the more um, exciting and public health uh, focused um, findings is that consumption of sugar sweetened beverages in men is associated with reduced fertility. And this is after accounting for female intake of sugar sweetened beverages and a whole host of other potential confounding variables. And uh, so we, yep. specifically, so you're looking at things like soda, juice, I guess. Yeah. Energy drinks, Energy. anything, anything. Um, well, so we looked at a whole range of different beverages, but when we look specifically at soda consumption, so we separate out the diet, you know, regular soda from diet, we separate out the fruit juice, we separate out the energy drinks. Um, we find that it's just the regular soda that seems to have the strongest effect. In fact, we, we found no effect of diet soda on male f fertility. Um, we also looked at caffeine intake, and that did not appear to be associated in a, in a strong way with male fertility. So we think it could be something that has to do with the sugar, uh, high, fructose, high fructose corn syrup that you tend to find in soda, something else about soda that might be harmful to male fertility. Wow. So if you're thinking about being a dad, maybe lay off the 30-ounce cans of Monster Energy drink or whatever whatever guys are drinking these days. Really interesting. So, okay, sodas, that's um, maybe interesting, or uh, certainly interesting, but maybe something that people would kind of think about not being good for their health. What are some of the other findings that you're looking at? We also looked at sleep duration in men. Um, we looked at the full spectrum, and we found that men who reported, on average, um, getting fewer than six hours of sleep per night in the previous months. This was the month prior to filling out the baseline questionnaire. Those men had about a 50% reduction in fertility in any given month of trying. Um, we also found a slight reduction in men who had been sleeping for longer than, than 10 hours, but the association for fewer than six hours held up when we did many different types of uh, secondary analyses. And this is interesting because um, testosterone seems to be a potential mechanism by which um, sleep deprivation can uh, affect fertility. Um, most men, most of the testosterone that a man will produce will be produced in sleep, during sleep. And so if men are not getting enough sleep, it's um, plausible that their testosterone levels might be too low. And testosterone is critical for healthy reproduction. Oh, really? So... 
guys make most of their testosterone when they're sleeping. I, I actually didn't know that. That's that's really interesting. And so you saw that guys who got, I guess it was an average of less than six hours had reduced fertility, but it was kind of a bell curve. So if you sleep more than, I don't know what guys are sleeping more than 10, that I'm kind of wildly jealous if guys are able to get more than 10 hours of sleep a night. But, but those guys also... And that could be because there are other unmeasured factors that could explain, you know, the association. We also had far fewer men who were sleeping 10 or more hours per day. So, but, but sleep deprivation, um, the prevalence of sleep deprivation in America is definitely on its way up. And so we had a relatively large proportion of men who were sleeping fewer than six hours per night. So that's something that I think is modifiable, hopefully. Um, and that men can do to improve their fertility if the association is real. Yeah, that's cool. Hey, we got a question here that pops up. Um, Tiffany wants to know, what does alcohol, I guess beer in particular, do to sperm? Dr. Wise, are you looking at, are you looking at alcohol and beer in your study? So we have, um, that was the third um, paper that we've been working on, looking at male alcohol consumption and fertility. We haven't looked at it in relation to sperm quality um, as of yet, but we certainly plan to do that in the next year or so. But when we look at fertility, how quickly couples get pregnant, um, men who consumed more than two drinks, alcoholic drinks per day actually had reduced fertility. Um, Consumption at, you know, levels lower than that were not associated with fertility. So it's something about this threshold, perhaps, of consuming two or more that might be harmful for fertility. I'm not exactly sure about the mechanisms. Again, there could be a hormonal mechanism because alcohol is known to decrease the clearance of various sex steroid hormones. So again, testosterone might be part of this causal mechanism if there is one. But um, we as epidemiologists are not really able to test um, causal mechanisms. We can just put our data on associations and that will be, um, you know, for bench scientists to figure out what the causal mechanisms might be. You're not looking at the why and the how. It's up to others to make their own, I guess, guesses and hypotheses to be tested. But you're just finding, well, there's a true correlation. When you're looking at 1,400 men, the numbers get... um, Pretty definitive. Let's switch gears for a second, because last week there was a big study that got published and uh, made a lot of waves. And the study, it kind of put to bed this debate that's been going on around, is there a decline in, in sperm quality happening? It was a, a big analysis of a lot of studies, almost 200 of them that have been done over the last 40 years and showed a pretty drastic decline in sperm count. And again, this, this, I believe this, these were epidemiologists as well, just looking at the data, not necessarily the why or the how. Um, what did you think when you saw that? And do you raise the alarm bells as some are raising about the potential extinction of the human species? Or what should we think when we hear that sperm counts are, are plummeting at what might be a pretty significant rate? I I was certainly surprised by the data. I mean, I had seen some data in the past looking at trends over time, um, but nothing on this scale. I mean, they they analyzed data from 185 studies and 43,000 men, and they found, you know, they did a number of different secondary analyses, and and the results kept holding up no matter what they did um, to restrict the data uh, and remove possible sources of bias. So I think um, the results are, you know, quite surprising and and shocking, but it's not really clear um, what's causing this. And and then the other question is, to what extent does having lower semen quality actually predict fertility? And that's Mm -hmm. one of the main questions we want to ask in the track study, um, because many studies have not been able to show a strong link between semen quality and and fertility so let's um so in in other words is having you know 50 million sperm per mil just as you know is that fine for fertility compared with 100 million like how many do you need so i i would say let's not get too alarmed but it's it's really something that um should prompt epidemiologists to look into possible causes of why? Yeah, 
let's, let's talk about that. I think a lot of people get confused around the difference between um, semen quality or sperm health and fertility. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the, the guys I talk to think they're kind of one and the same, but maybe take a minute just to explain the difference. Uh, how, do you, how would you define fertility and, and how would you define sperm quality? So what we measure in Presto is actually called fecundability. It's, it's a measure that um, you can actually quantify. You, you have a group of couples um, and you measure how many, um, you know, how long it takes them to get pregnant. You follow them forward in time and see how many months does it take. And so you calculate the number of pregnancies and that's called the number of cycles. Is that right? Fecund Let me put that on the screen for our audience so that fecundability. They, F going to learn a new word here today. F sorry, F E. That you got it. Okay, great. So, <laughs> so fecundability really is um, the average per cycle probability of conception in any given menstrual cycle. Okay. Um, so it's it's really like a, a group average. Um, and it's what's great about it is, you know, it's measurable. Fertility is harder to measure, you know, the number of births um, out of a population of, of, you know, women who are trying to conceive. Sometimes the denominator is not really um, clear. It's pretty vague. And then fecundity is really the reproductive capacity, you know, the capacity of a person to reproduce. And it's really not something that you can measure. Right. It's almost like an abstract measure. So fecundability is something that we use to get at fecundity, which is what we really want to know. How fertile are people? And then semen quality is really getting at one component. We, we've heard that 50% of all infertile couples have a male cause of infertility, and then 50% women are, you know, female cause. And of course, there's some overlap there. Um, so if you think of semen quality um, as predicting um, you know, the probability of implantation, the probability of fertilization and all these different steps along the way. Um, of course, it's going to be important. If you have zero sperm, it, it's going to be impossible to conceive. But the question of whether, you know, how much you need, you know, um, there's been a lot of research showing that male age is very strongly associated with semen quality. You can see dramatic drops in, you know, sperm concentration sperm, you know, semen volume, motility, you name it. But male age and fertility, the association isn't as strong. And the question is why? I mean, that's really always puzzled me. Yeah. So is it something about semen quality that is more predictive? You know, is it motility? Is it morphology? Are there subsets of these parameters that are more predictive than others? I think we can answer some of those questions going forward. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to ask you, so you've recently started a, another part of the Presto study looking at environmental factors, and this is something that got raised a lot last week too when the study came out about people putting out theories around um, different chemicals or things that are in the air, or the water. What are you looking at specifically? Um, you know, why is fertility of interest or why is the environment of interest for for fertility or fecundability outcomes? Sure, so we're very interested in studying the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals on fertility. And endocrine disruptor really refers to both naturally occurring compounds and sy synthetic chemicals um, that can basically interfere with the normal function of the endocrine system or the, you know, the hormones in our body. And there have been several studies documenting widespread exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals in reproductive aged women and men. Um, and actually studies documenting reproductive effects of these chemicals more so in men than in women. Um, so we're very interested in looking at several cast, uh, classes of these chemicals such as phthalates, um, phenols, you may have heard of bisphenol A or BPA, which is one of those well-known mm -hmm. chemical toxicants and some of these other lesser known uh, chemicals that might be in furniture and flame retardant chemicals. Um, and so we have a sub-study in Presto where we invite a subset of our participants who live in the Boston and Detroit areas to come in and provide urine and blood specimens. And with those specimens, we're able to um, look at some of these endocrine disrupting chemicals. 
And um, Shauna Swan and her colleagues who put out the paper on, you know, documenting the 50% the decline in sperm concentration over a 40 year period, they hypothesized that uh, exposure in utero or in the womb to these endocrine disrupting chemicals might be harmful to men. So I think, you know, we're very much at the beginning stage of this research and a lot needs to be done, but that might be one plausible mechanism by which um, the, you know, that might be one explanation why sperm counts are declining over time. And if so, we should be very worried about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We just got a good um, question here from the followers I'll put up. Um, so the question is from April. Thanks, April. What are some sources of endocrine disruptors? Dr. Wise? Great question. So um, exposures like phthalates are found in cosmetic pro products, in food packaging, um, in, in, in uh, plastic Covering, so they're basically these um, plasticizers. Um, they're they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere in the environment. It's really hard to avoid them. So everybody's exposed, but it it, it is that most you know people with very very high levels of exposure. And I should mention some of these medications that individuals take for mm -hmm. um, GI tract disorders have a coating over them and that has phthalates in them. So some people are getting very high doses of these chemicals and the extent to which that's related to these fertility outcomes needs to be better studied. Um, phenols are found in um, sunblock. You may have read the paper showing that uh, male exposure to certain kinds of sunblock um, might be associated with reduced uh, semen quality. Um, they're found in cream. Fortunately, uh, companies are not required to even list some of these ingredients or, you know, chemicals in their products. The FDA does not regulate them. Okay, so maybe something to just be aware of. Uh, if you're if you're thinking about this, start thinking about some of those chemicals, plastics, sunscreen, and and ask a few questions about what could this be doing. Hey, we've gotten some other good ones. I kind of we're kind of running out of time, but I want to get to these. So Laura asks a good question. So what can older men do about their lower sperm counts? And, and you mentioned age earlier, Doctor Wise. Um, maybe talk about the correlation between age and and fertility and and do you have any advice for older men who are trying to be dads? So I have to say that um, the link between older male age and fertility is not very strong. I think what's a lot stronger is male age is related to adverse pregnancy outcomes. So there's been a lot of research coming out recently on advanced paternal age and an increased risk of schizophrenia or an increased risk of autism in the child. So that those links have, are a lot stronger than any link between advanced male age and fertility per se. Um, so in terms of, you know, what, men, what older men can do to improve, um, you know, their semen quality, I don't even know to what extent that would improve their fertility, but they could, use, they could do the, the same things I would suggest to younger men, you know, get a good night's sleep, um, get your exercise, quit smoking, stop consuming sugar sweetened beverages you don't need them um you know the same list of of uh you know recommendations that i would give to any to man of any age right right well, we got another good one here so elliot asks a good question so his question is i heard exercise is good but what if the main way i exercise is cycling does that balance out and i presume that elliot's a, a cyclist and and I think sperm quality is something that is a little at the top of, of cyclist minds, maybe than other men. And I remember one of the questions when I took your Presto questionnaire had big pictures of what bike seat do you use? So what are you looking at um, in your study for, for cycling and what should guys know? Well, that's one of our main uh, research questions of interest. Does bicycling um, you know, reduce fecundability um, when you control for overall physical activity, because we know physical activity, uh, certainly moderate physical activity is good for health overall and also for fertility in general. Um, 
And so there could be, you know, many mechanisms that could explain why cycling might be something to um, be worried about. There's the physical trauma, perhaps by the, you know, the seat, is it a soft seat, a hard seat? And also heat, perhaps um, the excess heat. Uh, we know that um, the scrotum wants to be, you know, lower, you know, to keep the, the um, testes at a better temperature that's optimal for sperm production. So there are various mechanisms that could explain you know, a possible link between cycling and fertility. But there haven't been that many studies out there. And I, I should say that I did um, author a previous study on exercise, bicycling, and uh, sperm quality. And we did find some evidence that biking um, in excess of five hours per week was harmful to um, certain sperm parameters. But this was in a population of men who already had fertility problems. So there could have been some kind of selection bias in the study. So we need better studies to replicate that finding and just, it's just to make sure that um, there is a, a link there. So Presto will be able to answer that question hopefully in the next year or so. We do need larger numbers of men um, because it is quite rare that men would bike in excess of five hours per week. So we yeah. want to make sure we have enough men in each of the categories of exposure. Well, I think that's something where we can help help too is, you know, track is out there. It's, it's easy. It's convenient. Private way to get some sperm data. If there's any big cyclists watching or, or uh, advocacy groups that you know would want to work with us on the study, you know, shoot us an email or let us know because I think it'd be really interesting to look at um, on a deeper level. And, and you're right, the data is uh, implies that there's an issue, but let's follow the data and make sure the numbers tell us what, what they need to tell us. So uh, we're going to wrap up soon. This has been really educational and I encourage if there's other people with questions to write them in and Dr. Wise and I will, will get back to you. Maybe just to wrap up, you know, from all this study of looking at 5,400 women over the years and however many papers you've written on the topic, what what's some of the big advice that you would have for a couple that's maybe just at that stage of, of um, thinking about starting their family or early in the process, what would you tell them? So first and foremost, um, I would recommend that the women, the female partners start on prenatal vitamins or folate supplements because there's uh, really good evidence that um, folate you know, can prevent neural tube defects. So that's a pretty easy um, thing to start now as you're thinking about um, planning pregnancy. Um, also, women who are taking oral contraceptives or other hormonal contraceptive methods, um, like Depo-Provera, um, might consider um, stopping a few months earlier before uh, they start trying, because there's been, um, both from our study and other studies, we've documented that there's a transient delay in the return of fertility for women who have been using hormonal contraceptive methods. So some women might get very stressed if they're not getting pregnant quickly, but it really could be a residual effect of their hormonal contraceptive. Um, you might also want to start recording your fertility signs, tracking your menstrual cycles, um, measuring your basal body temperature to become more aware of when your fertile window might be. Um, there are some really cool software programs out there that can do that for you, like fertilityfriend.com. And actually, Presto, um, gives half of its participants a premium subscription to Fertility Friend upon entry into the study. Um, hmm. So that's one benefit that we give to our participants. Um, so, you know, become more aware of your menstrual cycle length when you are more likely to be fertile. If the couple um, is overweight or obese um, and they want to make changes to their, you know, their body size, I think this is a good time to do it because there's some evidence that, especially in women, that um, being overweight or obese can reduce fertility. So if this is something that can help motivate you to lose a little bit of weight, um, that might be um, something you can do now before you start trying. Um, there's also evidence that moderate physical activity is good for all women of, and men of all body sizes and um, an overweight and obese women, vigorous physical activity can also be very beneficial. Mm. 
Um, eating a well-balanced diet, I mean, I don't want to pretend that there are good data out there on diet and fertility, but certainly eating a well-balanced diet with fruits and vegetables, preferably um, organic without pesticides, if you can um, do that, um, eating healthy fats, lean proteins, that can, that can enhance fertility, reducing alcohol intake in the way that we talked about earlier to fewer than two glasses of, you know, or, or bottles of beer per day, and also um, cutting out all sugar sweetened uh, soda. I think soda, there's nothing nutritious about soda at all. It's really not needed in the American diet. Um, and then finally, you know, make sure you get enough sleep. So seven to nine hours per night is recommended um, by federal agencies and also quitting smoking. If you can quit smoking and have this be your motivation for doing that, I think that's a, a good strategy. Yeah, and I would just remind, um, I guess, the, the viewers that might be a little bit overwhelmed by Dr. Wise's list of all these, you know, <laughs> you know, my mom tells me the same things, but really what I like to tell people is a little bit of being more mindful for, you know, a short period of your life can make a big difference. Um, you know, we're talking about a few months can have a big impact. We're not talking about being a total buzzkill and, and trying to take away all your fun. But in this important time in your life, you're trying to start a family, you're getting ready to be a dad or a mom, you know, being a little bit more mindful, taking care of yourself first can go a long ways. And I think that that sums it up really well. Uh, this has been really fascinating and, and interesting, I think, for us, Dr. Wise. I'm going to put your website again on here. Uh, again, World of Facebook, if you are a young a young woman trying to get pregnant or thinking about it, um, I would highly recommend that you take part in this study. It's a fascinating look. Uh, Dr. Weiss is doing groundbreaking work on putting real numbers, real data to what makes a difference and what doesn't. And I think the opportunity now to be a part of it is, um, you know, if, if if this were four years ago and my wife and I were, were on the brink of trying to start our family, we would have definitely done it. I think it's really interesting. And and she needs people, right? You're looking to recruit all the time. And um, the more numbers that are in her study and her data set, the better it is. And that's going to help, help everyone. Any other uh, comments, questions, requests from you, Dr. Wise, before we sign off? And I would just add that if you're have, thinking about having a third child, Dr. Summer, feel free to enroll. This is not just for first-time parents. This is for um, all all couples who are trying to grow their family or start their family. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'll take you up on that when the time comes. I'll you know, definitely give you a call. And maybe get get into the uh, get into the VIP selection of the the data set. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. We'll do this again soon. I really appreciate your time this evening. And uh, like I said, to the rest of the audience, if there's more questions, feel free to just post them on our Facebook page and we'll get back to you soon. Thanks, Dr. Wise. Thanks so much, Dr. Summer. Bye. Yeah.